Hi, everybody. Welcome to our briefing today. Uh, I'm Dan Bursett. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And this is our fourth briefing in a five-part series, Farm Bill in Focus. And today, our look at the Farm Bill continues with the future of forestry in the Farm Bill. And I'd like to say a very special thanks right at the top to the Office of Representative Buddy Carter for helping us secure this great space today. Uh, and he'll be joining us via video remarks in just a moment as well. So thanks, Representative Carter and your great staff for helping us have a great conversation about forestry in the Farm Bill. Um, our briefing today is very proudly presented in partnership with our friends at U.S. Nature for Climate. Um, let me tell you a little bit about this great organization. U.S. Nature for Climate is a coalition of 26 organizations dedicated to advancing implementation of natural climate solutions in the United States. Coalition members represent a wide variety of sectors, including organizations focused on conservation, agriculture, forestry, sustainable business, outdoor recreation, and our oceans and coastlines. And together, this coalition is raising awareness of the numerous economic, health, and environmental benefits provided by natural climate solutions and ensuring that the potential of the America's natural and working lands are fully integrated into border climate action efforts. If you'd like to learn more about U.S. Nature for Climate, I encourage you to check them out online at www.usnatureforclimate.org. They are great partners, and um, we're very pleased to once again work with them to bring a briefing to Capitol Hill. Uh, about EESI, uh, EESI was founded in... Uh oh. Oh, okay. Okay. No, I need a pop filter. Uh, okay. Let me tell you a little bit about EESI. Um, ESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to specifically provide educational resources about climate change topics to policymakers. Originally, we were focused on environmental and energy, and then in 1988, we broadened our focus to climate change. Uh, today, we uh, do all sorts of great congressional education programming, like briefings. We also do a lot of writing. We do articles, fact sheets, issue briefs. We have a really tremendous stable of Farm Bill side-by-sides uh, that are available on our Farm Bill resources page. We have a climate solutions map, so you can look up uh, what's happening in your state uh, to get specifically solutions-oriented information uh, about what's going on across the country. We also have a hearing tracker uh, going all the way back to the beginning of the 117th Congress. So if you are looking for a very easy way to keep up uh, with hearings, uh, especially related to the Farm Bill on, with, with climate focus, we have a great resource to help you do that. Uh, we also, over time, have developed some expertise working with rural utilities to access USDA programs and provide inclusive financing to their customers. And so Farm Bill is something that we care about uh, from a policy perspective, but we also see firsthand how investments in rural America uh, benefit the country in general and, and really are critical if we're going to decarbonize uh, the entire economy uh, to, um, in order to advance climate solutions. Uh, we have, uh, I mentioned the briefings, we have a great newsletter. It comes out every other Tuesday. If you haven't already subscribed to Climate Change Solutions, I encourage you to do that. Uh, the best way you can do that is to visit us online at www.eesi.org. I mentioned the fact sheets. We're also on social media. I mentioned this is the fourth of our briefings. We've also done one on the process. Um, so if you're new to the Farm Bill, which many of you are, uh, we have a great briefing about that. It's also a great briefing to, for ideas about how you can help your boss engage uh, in the Farm Bill productively. And I know there's some big deadlines coming up this week in the House uh, in terms of member requests and member priorities and things like that. We also did one on what we called climate, economic, and environmental win-win-wins. Uh, that was briefing number two. Briefing number three was two weeks ago. That was on rural development. And then we're back two weeks from today on June 21st to talk about conservation. But we do more than just Farm Bill. We also did a recent briefing on, uh, with the Department of Energy uh, on the Office of Nuclear Energy Programs. Uh, we did one, again, with DOE, or the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Um, we did a briefing uh, about organics and agriculture with our friends at Natural Resources Defense Council. We did Congressional Climate Camp for the first couple months of the year. And our last briefing really focused on implementation of the IRA and IAJ. So we have a lot of great stuff. And pretty much, I challenge anyone to kind of say, well, what's a climate change topic? Or to come up with a climate change topic that we don't have a resource from the last year or two. Uh, and because I, I bet we do. And if we don't, hello, Aaliyah. It's great to see you. Aaliyah was on our rural development panel. She's with the National Cooperative Business Association. And I am always, a, it's always just so nice to see Aaliyah. So hi, how's it going? Uh, she did a great job, and so I definitely encourage you to um, visit us online and watch that briefing, because all of these briefings are live cast. Um, Climate-friendly uh, climate forestry, excuse me, can provide multiple benefits, including greenhouse gas emissions reductions, enhanced resilience to wildfires and extreme heat, 
innovation in materials and practices, and economic development opportunities in rural communities. Our panelists today will describe forestry-related programs in the Farm Bill and discuss essential topics like wildfire management, wood products, carbon markets, and urban forestry. Um, let me just click through. I always forget to click. There's our Farm Bill stuff. Look at all this cool stuff. That's the hearing tracker. Those are the side-by-side-by-sides. So this is going to be great if you're tracking. Uh, we have about 20 or so of these that are either online or coming online. We're comparing the existing, uh, existing farm bill, so the existing law, with what the House and the Senate produce. And we'll use formatting so you can make quick comparisons between uh, what the House and Senate are proposing and also how those are different. Because eventually the farm bill will, have to be or will likely be resolved in conference. And so the differences between what the two chambers are look working on is just as important as the difference between what they're proposing and, and how that compares with the existing law. Uh, our farm bill series. Oh, that's too far. OK. Um, wait. Yeah. OK. Um, so let me uh, end there and uh, introduce our first speaker who is joining us via video recording. And that is Representative Earl L. Buddy Carter. Representative Carter represents the 1st District of Georgia in Congress. He's an experienced businessman, healthcare professional, and faithful public servant. Before being elected to Congress, he served as the mayor of Pooler, Georgia, and in the Georgia General Assembly, where he used his business experience to make government more efficient and responsive to the people. Today, Representative Carter serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee and the House Budget Committee, and we're really, really happy to have him join us and share some thoughts about forestry. Take it away. Good afternoon, and thank you to the Environmental and Energy Study Institute for holding this briefing today on an incredibly important topic. Forestry is something that is near and dear to my heart because I've had the honor and privilege of representing Georgia, the number one forestry state in the nation, as a member of Congress. That's right, Georgia is the number one forestry state in the country. Georgia has 22 million acres of commercially available private timberland more than any other state. Georgia tops every other state in the nation in terms of pure volume of timber harvested, all while overall tree volume in Georgia has been net increasing since 1953. We're incredibly proud of this in Georgia. In fact, one of my favorite sayings in South Georgia is, when you breathe fresh air, get on your knees and thank the farmer who grew the trees. Forests of all kinds, on private land or on federally protected land, are vital to our environment and our economy. It is proposed that a single large tree can provide a day's supply of oxygen for up to four people. At the same time, that tree is pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and storing it in its fibers. That carbon dioxide stays within that tree and whatever product it ends up going into. Factor in the other benefits that forests provide by filtering water, providing habitats to wildlife, and more. And you can quickly see that forests are essential and must be protected, especially as we start to craft a farm bill. Forest landowners face immense financial burdens planning and maintaining their land. These pressures are made worse when a natural disaster occurs and destroys an investment that takes 20 years or more to come to fruition. We need to ensure that forest landowners are not unfairly punished by our tax code when disasters occur and private forest owners discover that their ability to claim a casualty loss for destroyed timber is limited, often to zero dollars. That's why I hope to see a fix to the casualty loss issue, which will provide an immediate and permanent solution for forest landowners to keep their forests working, a vital part of rural economies. Otherwise, I fear we will see fewer and fewer landowners using their land for forest and turn to other kinds of developments that, unfortunately, don't provide the environmental benefits forests do. Also, we should ensure we are getting the best data available on our forests through the forest inventory analysis. FIA data is a critical tool for forest landowners, especially as forest carbon markets become increasingly important. I'd like to thank the panelists for their participation today and hope everyone leaves with the knowledge of what we can do through the Farm Bill to maintain our forest. Thank you, and God bless. Great. Thank you, Representative Carter. That was a great introduction to the topic today. Um, before we turn to our panel, I just want to remind everyone that after uh, our discussion, we will have a question and answer period, and that question and answer period will be rooted in the presentations that you're about to see. So. Uh, we'll be branching out into all sorts of forestry topics, so whatever you do, don't leave too soon. And that, that concludes the pun portion of the program today. 
More seriously, for our online audience, and we have a robust online audience today, if you have a question, you can ask it by sending us an email. And the email address to use is ask at eesi.org. That's ask at eesi.org. You're getting a preview of, <laughs> of Dan O's file management system, so that's a treat. Um, and <laughs> um, uh, you can also follow us on social media at EESI online. Uh, we will do our best to incorporate questions we get from our online audience into the discussion. And we will have a microphone in the room. So our in-person audience today, which is likewise robust, will also have a time, will have, also have an opportunity to take questions for our panelists. Lauren Cooper is our first panelist today. Lauren is the Chief Conservation Officer at the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. There, she leads the conservation pillar and provides conservation leadership internally as well as externally to SFI's network of resource professionals, landowners, educators, local communities, indigenous peoples, and governments. Lauren founded the Forest Carbon and Climate Program at Michigan State University. She has international experience working with indigenous communities in Peru, Mexico, Ecuador, and the U.S. She has served as a steering, com member, st steering committee member on both the Women's Forest Congress and the Forest Climate Working Group and co-chaired the National and Work, Natural, excuse me, and Working Lands Group for the Michigan Council on Climate Solutions. Lauren, it is great to have you on our panel today. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Well, thanks so much, Jan. Um, and I want to start off with just a quick acknowledgement. It's wonderful to be here and to see everyone. Thanks to all of you for coming. It's really nice to have an opportunity to present in person. Um, and again, wanted to thank Representative Carter for the support and the opening um, words here because there's a lot of alignment with, with what I'm going to present. It actually probably saved me a little time because I don't have to <laughs> repeat all of those points. Um, and th thanks to my uh, colleagues on the panel with me. I'm looking forward to hearing their presentations as well. Um, so actually, so to get started, um, so again, I'm Lauren Cooper, and I lead the, um, again, I'm the Chief Conservation Officer in, at the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. And if you're not familiar, we um, are a, a large and diverse organization that does a lot of work um, on education. Uh, we have a large education um, body, but we also have standards and certify sustainable practices across a very large footprint in North America, 350 million acres. Um, and so my time today, I'm going to provide um, a basic science introduction because um, as my other introduction said, I um, have about 10 years coming from academia where I've worked in science synthesis and communicating the core principles of forest and climate change um, to various audiences. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, there's tons of resources um, in that program as well. And I'll have some of the some slides coming from my team there as well. Um, I'm going to start off with a science introduction. I'm then going to talk about solutions to some of the challenges I present um, and then make some direct linkages to the Farm Bill. Uh, this is a way to visualize. This may be familiar to, to you, but this is one of our options to visualize the um, addressing climate change. Like, do I have a pointer on here? Yes, I do. Okay, so I'll use this. So um, the, one of the challenges, um, we have basically here historical emissions going into the future um, and, a, and a very concerning trend. Um, as we all know that climate change um, is already affecting us and we have a hazy day in Washington DC unfortunately due to a pretty um, horrendous fire situation unfolding in Canada right now. Um, and the, the idea here is we have the, the blue or the, the black line is our um, ongoing emissions, but we want to get down here to this green line um, to avoid catastrophic climate impacts. A lot of the, the efforts need to um, in, involve reducing our fossil fuel use, um, but this green line here is this idea of natural climate solutions or nature-based solutions. There's different terms, but it's the same idea that must also be undertaken to address climate change. So this is not an either or, this is a, 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 on all fronts. Um, addressing climate change. Um, the exciting thing about natural climate solutions is there's a lot of co-benefits, what we would call co-benefits or additional benefits from undertaking these. Um, and I'll get into those in a moment. But um, over here, this, this pie chart is, kind of, is breaking down what this green line looks like. So what are the natural climate solutions? And my next slide will show them in more detail. But just to give you a sense of, if you were to break these down further, both this large green and this blue one are related to forestry. Um, and, and there even are, are some other ones. Um, and so I'll, here, I'll show you on the next slide in a little more detail um, just how important forestry and forest practices are uh, out of the total of nature-based solutions. Um, and that's certainly not to minimize. These are also very important activities and other aspects of agricultural. We would call these natural and working lands, um, but very unique and, um, 
uh, and really widespread opportunities in trees and forests. Uh, you can see the reforest opp opportunity is really literally off the chart in this case. Um, and it's because many of us reside in places that used to have more trees. And so there's an opportunity for, for restoration, reforestation. Um, and so this is just to give you a sense of what these solutions look like and what a nature-based solution is. And so when we look at the challenge of climate change and we're considering nature-based solutions, um, I want to introduce these in a little more detail. There's different ways to cut, to cut this or to communicate about these ideas. But I like this, I like this approach where um, maybe taking it as three major um, tactics that you could undertake. The first is increase or maintain your forest land, so the actual extent to the geography. Maintain or increase your carbon stocks, and so that could be making sure your forests are healthy, um, maybe undertaking activities to increase carbon in places where it's appropriate to do so. And then the last one is increasing sustainable wood use. And I'll explain a little more of each of these and give a quick example. So in terms of increasing or maintaining forest land, the concern here is that um, we have a lot of development pressure, as we, we just heard um, from Representative Carter, a concern of um, how do we maintain the value of our forests so that we are maintaining the forest extent that we currently have. Um, and the U.S. has not had a lot of de have deforestation. We're actually losing forests in recent decades, but those projections are changing. Um, and it does depend on your state and where you are, of course. Um, but some projections uh, are that we could lose up to 3% of our forests um, by 2050 on, on the current trajectories that where we are. And this is, this is really across multiple types of landholders, including private timberland areas. Um, and then there's also big restoration opportunities. We have also had fires here in the United States. Some of them are so severe that without inter interventions, they will, they will not be forests or they would take a very, very long time to recover. So that's really a loss of our forest extent as well if we allow that to happen. Um, and so there's many opportunities across all land to owner types and even in our urban landscapes. Um, and so these tactics are avoiding conversion, reforestation and afforestation. And afforestation is the idea of adding trees in a place that has not been forested recently. So if you had an, an, an abandoned, abandoned ag area in the Midwest that has not been forested for 150 years and we plant trees on that, we would call that afforestation. Um, and so one of the solutions to this is bolstering demand for working forests. This is an effort called like keeping forests as forests. Um, we do make a lot of decisions driven by economics. And so um, having markets for materials is very important. Um, and minimizing incentives to develop, but maximizing incentives to keep forests, keep them healthy, keep them valuable, um, and making that attractive to landowners is, is one of the solutions. Um, going back to the, the maintaining or increasing carbon stocks, these are largely considered very cost-effective opportunities. Um, they can be scaled rapidly across with current landowners, and reforestation can be pricey and expensive. Um, but there's a lot of approaches in here, which is increasing resilience um, or undertaking strategies to allow trees to get older, for example, where they would store more carbon than otherwise. And um, so there's a range of, of tactics that could be appropriate for different landowners and in different areas. Um, and these could include um, improving your forest management. There's opportunities in agroforestry, so adding trees to agricultural landscapes or urban forestry. Um, adapting to climate change is another one, making sure we're not losing that carbon in the future, even if you maintain your forest extent. If you have a lot of disturbance, is what we would call a, um, a something that negatively impacts trees and forests, you'll, you'll lose carbon if your trees start dying. And so this is the idea of climate change as a threat multiplier. And so there's lots of opportunities in the Farm Bill, for example, to think about these are words like resilience or adaptation that look and consider how can we make sure our forests are healthy into the future. Unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of thinking about sustainability in the way that, that maybe foresters did um, 40 years ago because we're in a changing situation. And so we need to think about um, how these dynamics are changing and unfortunately how they're overlapping. So in some areas, you have, so we have something called oak, um, oak decline is one example, where at first almost inexplicably, uh, large oak trees were, were dying. Um, and there's, a, there's the theory now that it's because of these multiple pressures that are coming together, just changes in the raining cycle, um, in, increased drought other times, that's just changing the pressure and it's actually causing mortality of trees. Um, and then what we also see is that when you add fire risk on it, you end up having catastrophic fires or pests that are surviving winters in places they wouldn't otherwise. 
Um, and so there's this kind of a complexity in the forestry space, but there's lots of opportunity to ensure that the Farm Bill is supporting people that are working on these types of topics and can um, make the interventions necessary. And then the final one is sustainable wood use. Um, and so the primary approaches here, we um, heard from Representative Carter that, um, that our trees store carbon. And so when you use wood products, they're actually storing that carbon. Um, and so it's, sometimes it can seem like we're talking about something kind of abstract with, with gases and then there's trees absorbing carbon, but it's actually quite physical. Like if, any, if you have a log that you're about to throw on a fire, it's dried out and you weighed it, it's about 50% carbon. And that's actually CO2 from, that came from the atmosphere through photosynthesis and is broken down in the process of developing sugars for um, the tree processing, but it also takes that material into its physical structure. And so that's how trees hold carbon. So when you see this woody material, um, it's actually storing carbon throughout as long as it's in that woody material form. Um, and then also though, wood um, has a, is a lower emission material and compared to steel, plastics, and concrete. So when we're substituting for trees, which are a natural resource and a renewable resource, um, we're reducing those other emissions. And I have an example of that on my next slide. Also, there's opportunities in energy production. So co-firing woody waste materials um, or woody materials with natural gas, for example. Um, and then um, one thing I always like to point out, though, is there's lots of opportunity for innovation um, in efficiency improvements. We have a lot of inefficiencies in our economy overall. Um, we don't use materials for as long as we should. We're not um, making connections to recycle materials as much as we should. So I want to point that out, that this is part of the wood utilization um, opportunity, and the Farm Bill can certainly uh, support this type of innovation. And then just quickly, here's an example of a mass timber building that was built in Michigan. It's the first one in Michigan on MSU's campus um, that used, uh, it's, it's called mass timber construction. And so it uses this in place of steel um, and concrete. Um, and it's storing carbon now in, within this building. As in, and, it, uh, and it also was uh, built faster and with fewer emissions than if it had traditional building materials. So this is an exciting place. And there's lots of connections to the farm bill and wood innovation. And so for my last section here, I wanted to talk about taking action. Um, and so what does an ambitious policy agenda look like, but with safeguards to ensure that we are not causing unintentional harm and negative consequences. Um, so one of the big ideas that I wanted to talk about and touch on is this idea of a transformational bioeconomy. So climate change is a very complicated, big challenge. And um, we have been approaching it in, in um, various ways. Uh, but really, I mean, I would suggest thinking about this in a, in a really ambitious way that our, our, we need to kind of fundamentally change the materials that we're using, how we're using them. And this has effects for um, jobs, employment. But then the great thing about forestry, it has a lot of other benefits. So you look at forests and um, there's, there's climate regulation, there's water filtration, there's flood protection, there's a lot of adaptation benefits as well. So forests are a very holistic way to think about supporting um, our economy and can be a really great place to invest in a transformation that will be supportive to um, employment and to our natural landscapes um, going into the future. And so I wanted to list out just some specific strategies here for the Farm Bill. Um, and start off with uh, one key point is that there are some really wonderful expert organizations and coalitions that provide um, focused recommendations. There's a forest, uh, forest climate working group that I've been heavily involved in for um, last more than a handful of years uh, that puts out more high level policy recommendations. But there's also a forest and the farm bill coalition that provides very detailed um, recommendations and as a, a really great diverse group of actors involved in that. So just want to make sure I mention that. Um, and so some of these types of topics, you'll see them in, in these types of recommendations, um, but there's opportunities to focus on forest management. So this is um, restoration, reducing fire, fire risk, um, having partnerships across jurisdictions. So things like the Good Neighbor Authority, um, also across private lands. Um, and then protecting forest lands from conversion. We also have the research community. So this is federal, private, academia, um, and supporting the FIA, the Forest Inventory and Analysis Program that creates data that the research community can use to understand trends um, and make recommendations for management. Um, also, again, advancing markets for forests and forest products. So this includes traditional products like wood and fiber, but also non-traditional um, products and new markets like 
carbon and biodiversity credits, water, and non-timber forest products. So diversifying the options for landowners to be able to make the economic rationale to keep their forests and to, and to have enough resources to manage those forests well and to reduce um, risks of, of climate harm, uh, for example, for fire risk. Um, and again, reducing or increasing efficiency and reducing waste. Um, Workforce development is a huge topic, and uh, what's really exciting about forestry is these are distributed jobs. They're across the rural landscapes, um, everything from forest man uh, management to manufacturing in the built environment, increase in urban forestry, um, lots of innovation for materials, everything from glues to foams, replacing materials. I know the auto industry is looking at and exploring replacing uh, a lot of traditional fossil fuel based materials with uh, tree based materials. So very exciting space in here. Um, and this is a publication from SFI. It's a journey of black professionals and really looking at how do we diversify not only the workforce, but diversify who's joining that workforce um, as part of this economic transformation that's, that's really needed. Um, and then finally, questions of equity and social justice in urban and community forestry. Um, and how climate is going to negatively affect certain, um, well, all of us, but certain segments of the population more than others, um, and making sure that we're holistically engaging and addressing that now. And then I wanted to quickly touch on this idea of best practices. Um, so we can move boldly, but there's also trade-offs when you enter force are complex and so there can be negative impacts and we also have a co-occurring global biodiversity crisis so safeguards are as actions we can take to assess the potential um, harm and then take steps to, to minimize that harm and one of the cool things about forestry is I have this um, scale here because this is from a paper um, that um, I have published that talks about how in forestry, though, we have these indicators that they can be negative, but they could also be positive. So biodiversity is when you don't want to have a negative impact, but with that same indicator, you may be having a positive impact. Um, and so it's not just risk mitigation. There's also great benefits. But the key is identifying what those indicators are. Um, and I was just going to quickly touch on two tools for safeguarding um, and for providing the guidelines of best practices. This was just approved last month. We have at SFI a new, and it's the first of its kind, urban and community forestry sustainability standard, which really lays out what those good practices are in the built environment, um, what the benefits are, how to be thinking about um, interventions. There's a lot of uh, opportunities to increase canopy cover um, and really just raise the level of what does, what does the urban forest provide for us and what is the best practices towards furthering that. And certainly, again, lots of linkages to workforce development. And then there's also in, within the SFI, we have a brand new, in the last revision, uh, a new standard or new objective in the standard on climate smart forestry. And this provides requirements to uh, the certified organizations in our 350 million acre footprint um, to consider climate change. So both um, assess the risk and, and make um, concrete plans for adaptation and mitigation. So if you're interested in learning more about some of the tools and best practices, there's lots of opportunities to partner across jurisdictions um, on these types of um, best practices. And then my last slide, um, I just wanted to highlight that there is, um, a, in all of the things I've shared, there's this opportunity, very robust within the, the Farm Bill, to look across different types of opportunities of, of lands, um, everything from uh, areas that are deforested or degraded um, to areas that have minimal or no interventions. And they have different benefits and they need different interventions and they would interact with different components of the Farm Bill. Um, and this is a new paper, I just, it's actually just was published today. So if you're interested in learning more about this different phrases that are used, but climate smart forestry. And what we're suggesting here is that it needs to be broader and make sure that we're um, encompassing all ends of the forested spectrum, including the built environment, um, to our areas that would be appropriate for high carbon storage. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oops. Would you like this back? Yes. OK, and your pen. Thank you. I like the idea that maybe this morning you hit publish. I got to get to the briefing. <laughs> um, that was great. Uh, Lauren had really great slides. Just to want to make a reminder or share a reminder that um, all of the presentation materials are available on our website on the briefing page. So you can go back and review Lauren's slides as well as everyone else's. Um, you can also watch an archive of the live cast. And in the next couple of weeks, there'll be summary notes as well. So if you want to come back and revisit the briefing, it'll be an easy way to do that. Lauren, you also mentioned mass timber. We have a mass timber fact sheet that's coming out pretty, pretty quickly, actually. 
Uh, and so that'll be something that we'll make sure that everybody uh, who RSVPs to, to the briefing today and, and signs up to get that information. Also a great way to um, stay, in the, stay informed is just climate change solutions. It's that bi-weekly newsletter. Our second panelist today is Brendan Shane. Brendan is the climate director at the Trust for Public Land and leads efforts to uh, leverage the power of parks and land protection to build more climate resilient communities. Uh, the Trust for Public Lands climate program works nationwide with communities of all sizes across a wide range of landscapes to address the increasingly dangerous impacts of climate change through natural and nature-based practices. Uh, before that, Brendan served as regional director for North America and Deadline 2020 program director for the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group as Chief of Policy and Sustainability for the DC government and the Environmental Director for the Anacostia Waterfront Corporation. Brendan, uh, really looking forward to your remarks. I'll turn the lectern over to you. Thanks. Great, thank you. <clears throat> it's really a pleasure to be here and I'll, I'll just add to Lauren's thanks. First of all, Lauren is, is just sort of a powerhouse in this field and so great to have her on the panel. So, um, a, a tremendous resource. But, um, Thanks to ESI, I've been a longtime fan, and also TPL is a, a member of U.S. Nature for Climate, so we really appreciate that partnership to draw attention to the, the natural, uh, nature-based solutions. Um, often they get short shrift, but they shouldn't for some of the, all the reasons we'll, we'll discuss. And, and I'm happy to dig in today on urban forestry, or I should click this maybe, huh? Yeah, uh, dig in a little bit on urban forestry um, or actually, I think the Forest Service has this right, and, and Lauren already referenced this. The Forest Service calls it the Urban and Community Forestry Program, right? So this is not urban. This is not Manhattan forestry. This is forestry in every community, small and large, across America. And the benefits we're talking about, Lauren was starting to talk about, um, and then I'll talk about, you know, they accrue to everybody. Uh, everyone deserves that sort of nature access, the benefits of green space. Um, and. At TPL, just quickly, that's, that's what we do. So we work across the country from a number of uh, field offices and then on national policy, on state policy. Um, we say connecting everyone to the outdoors, but th what that really means is, you know, in, in today's world and in the climate, uh, from the climate perspective, building more resilient, climate resilient communities. Um, so uh, just quickly, you know, so what does this look like? Uh, yeah, to the, to the point, um, this looks different everywhere. But it all but it all matters so I'm just sort of clicking through uh, a few of the projects we work on around the country starting in, in Florida um, I really I really want a big big message is that trees in communities are one of the most powerful natural climate solutions so you know we people like trees right people like to be near trees and people intuitively understand the benefits uh, and then we we pay a price people's health suffers people's mental health suffers when we lose that that tree canopy, which we are. And I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, so, Florida, Hawaii, in, you know, Montana, smaller communities, larger communities, community forests. I'll talk about a little bit later. In Vermont, more urban settings. This is you know a recently reconstructed playground at a school in New York City. So, which formerly was just asphalt. I grew up on a playground. Just asphalt. This one was like that a few years ago, uh, and so bringing forestry and, and, and urban canopy into communities that haven't had it previously. Um, Atlanta, Georgia, um, small towns, you know, all around the country, as well as uh, as well as our med major metro areas. So, um, in all of these places, the the importance it's always been important, uh, but it's it's growing. In, the importance is growing because of the. The, the, is, the issues we, we're dealing with with climate. So the shade that you get under a tree, and I just walk my dog from one tree to another on a sunny day, right? I just pick the side that's shadier, and I pick the say, you know, that's how, it, it, people understand this, but it's, it's just growing more, in, increasingly more important. So when you look across the country, we understand that uh, extreme heat is growing. Um, I put up stats for Burlington, Vermont, because you know, it's not all, it's not just growing in the south, right? Matter of fact, it's warming more rapidly in the north. So when you look at Burlington, or let's say you go across to Minnesota, Washington, you know, into the northern latitudes, um, places that never had, or had zero average historic days above 100 heat index will shift to eight in the next couple of decades, and you'll be looking at close to a month of a 100 degree heat index in Burlington, Vermont, later this, later this century. So now is the time to plant the tree that will be 20, 30, 40, 50 years old when you get to 2070, 2080. 
right? So it's, it's also imperative. Sometimes it's hard to think that far in advance, but uh, we need to plan now. Uh, same way on the, on the flooding side. We, we tend to look at, 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 at heat and, and managing stormwater and flood intensity as you know, two big primary issues, benefits of urban forestry. But the same way we have heat rising, we have changes in precipitation, and you have really intense storms. Trees can do a, a really remarkable job as green infrastructure to help cities manage uh, more intense storms. So there's a great report out just this year um, from Climate Central, who is a resource I would always point people toward. They're just wonderful at bringing, well, as Lauren was describing, bringing the science together and making it applicable. So this is Jacksonville for Duval County. I just happened to grab, but this report, there's a whole online set of resources for two, 300 communities and counties. You can go in and you can see the report. What are the benefits as they roll up uh, of that stormwater management? So that is... You know, it's a, it sounds like a great thing, but when you think about it, well, that's less flooding in a home, it's less flooding in a street, it's less storm, you know, less pollution into streams, it's less erosion in the stream. You know, there's, the benefits are, are significant. Um, the congressman mentioned, you know, air pollution benefits, right? So that's true out in the in rural lands, it's true in the urban lands. So, you know, significant benefits of pollutant removed. And then he also mentioned carbon, carbon capture. So I'll just click through these quickly that, you know, they have a map you can go in and find, you can look at counties across the country for uh, stormwater runoff, for air pollution, for carbon removal. Um, I, I will mention though, since I'm talking, focusing a little bit here on urban community, community, urban and community. So I grew up in Western Iowa, which looks like, well, there's no real benefit here, you know, in Western Iowa. Well, there is actually, because in Sioux City where I grew up, you know, it's the forested part of Western Iowa, is, is the community. And you go down the road to Lamar's or some other small town and you'll see, you can tell when you're getting to the town because you see the trees, right? So uh, as you roll it up to counties and as you look state by state, the numbers are not as large, but that benefit to air quality, to stormwater capture um, is significant in communities everywhere in the country. And it rolls up from a climate perspective. So when, when the EPA rolls up the numbers for the climate inventory, you see 15% of all the carbon that's sequestered by forests in the United States are these trees that are in a community, right? So this is a big chunk. Uh, one out of seven, you know, a seventh of the problem, and, and it's an opportunity um, to grow that, um, to have that sort of broader natural climate solution benefit from a global perspective. Um, just to dig in a little bit, you can go on and on, and there are wonderful new resources um, about the benefits of trees. So I'll just hit a couple of highlights here, but resources, I forgot to put the website on here, but healthytreeshealthylives.org is one, one summary. I mean, and they just sort of go through the benefits. The research is significant and growing all the time. The science is backing up what many of us sort of might have known to begin with, that it strengthens your body, right? that it nourishes the mind, boosts healing, improves financial health. So you can go through all of these, uh, all the studies. Um, clearly some of the big benefits, increased canopy is gonna reduce and cool a community um, as the heat increases, right? And that's just directly related to health. So the cooler you are, the more you have the ability to get cool on a hot day, the healthier you will be, particularly for the old, for the young, for the, uh, for health uh, impaired people. Um, the, the mental health connection is huge. So one really fascinating study basically says the more tree canopy you have in poorer communities, the, the, the fewer mental health problems you see on, on, in average, right? So it's, it is, there's a whole suite of, of data and science connecting the benefits of being in and around trees to people's mental health. Um, two great resources to look at here. So. Because um, the question is, you know, for your districts or wherever, well, how does my canopy compare? Where do I have canopy where I don't? Uh, so American Forest, a great partner, they have treeequityscore.org um, for most of the country. Um, ParkServe is a TPL resource showing the green spaces, parks in every community across the country. Um, and uh, for instance, ParkServe currently has heat mapping for every community across the country. As, uh, as well as um, other sort of climate and health related risks. One last piece, since TPL focused on creating parks, national parks, neighborhood parks, 
trails, community schoolyards of all kinds. This study is, is actually just being released today at the International Play Association in Scotland. Um, you know, it's some of the new, brand new data on, on the relationship between trees and parks. So that's super exciting for us. But when you look at, when you look at parks, the number one determinant of usage is, is it near people, right? So it's a location, right? If it's close to people, it's used more. The second biggest determinant in this study is the presence of mature trees. So the parks that will ramp up uses the highest uh, are the ones with trees. And so those are, that's where you get the community connection benefit. You get the play education benefit. You know, get all those other benefits um, as well um, when your park has, has mature trees. So um, just some other, some kind of wrap up numbers. Um, there's a lot of, this is not a small piece. I mentioned 15% of the carbon captured. This rolls up to 127 million acres, five plus billion trees. The US Forest Service and FIA and their iTree Suite, they have wonderful resources for sort of putting dollar signs, right? So that rolls up to $18 billion in, um, in benefits. Um, but uh, Forest Service has also documented that we're losing it, right? So, so in the community space, we're losing on average 175,000 acres, 36 million trees a year. Um, public space, this is overall, right? So it's public space, it's private space. Um, all of which need to sort of redouble efforts to, to reverse that, that trend. And uh, in particular, just to highlight that, you know, we're losing trees, but many of our communities haven't had trees for generations, right? So we have particularly look at some of these fascinating studies of the correlation of redlining uh, to tree canopy today, and it's basically the same map. And when you look at, you know, class D redline versus class A, I mean, it, this is half as much canopy. And in many places, it's well less than half. So, um, so the emphasis, you know, we need to build more canopy everywhere for the benefits. But um, for instance, in the US Forest Service, new urban and community forestry program that's rolling out now, um, very concerted effort to direct that funding to underserved communities. So just a few policy recommendations. I mean, the, the first one is the big one, right? IRA. 1.5 billion for urban and community forestry, unprecedented funding into that program that is just, you know, has a huge potential for impacting communities all across the country. So um, in continuing that and, and then specifics of, you know, waiving match requirements and um, um, promoting it in, a, in a way that's more accessible is really, is really critical. Uh, I wanted, I mentioned super briefly at the beginning, the community forest program. Most people may not even have heard of it. But TPL has been working with communities, rural communities all across the country under the Forest Service Community Forest Program. And I, we just like to highlight it. It's an amazing program. It basically facilitates a community to buy the forest that they live in or live adjacent to. It may be their water supply. It may be a recreational land. It may be working lands that's near them. And so you end up with communities, small towns that actually pay part of their budget. They'll run their operations off of the recreation, the, uh, the water protection, the, the wood uh, timbering and such from land that they own. An amazing program that we're hoping will grow in, in the farm, farm bill. And then I also was just mentioning a, a priority from our, our team. So we don't just do urban work. We do millions of acres of conservation all across the country. And so just to maybe you know come full circle, it, it's, it really is all related. And, and to the points that others on the panel will make, um, proposals like the uh, forest conservation easement program that are more focused on larger tracts of private lands, um, you know, they're going to advance climate smart forestry. They're going to be um, building uh, jobs and providing the climate benefits that, that we need. So I will stop there. Thank you, Brennan. At some point, I'm going to start being skeptical that these reports are actually being published today. I'll, I believe Lauren, because she went first. I, Brendan, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, but Freddie and Christine, if you try to claim that something's being published today, I think we'll meet that with skepticism. Um, Brendan, you mentioned extreme heat. Just about a year ago, we did a briefing on extreme heat. It was part of our, our Living with Climate Change briefing series from um, um, last, I think it was like April through June. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that, we had some really excellent experts uh, joining us on that panel uh, and that's available on our website. You can um, search for that. 
Um, we've covered a lot of ground. We will cover a lot of ground. I'm sure there's lots of questions. So for folks in the room, when we get to the Q&A, uh, we will have a microphone and an opportunity to have a conversation with our panelists. If you're in our online audience, uh, you can send us an email uh, with your question. That's askask at eesi.org. You can follow us on social media at eesi online. Our third panelist today is Freddie Davis. Uh, Freddie is the director of the Rural Training and Research Center at the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. The, this collective membership, or the collective membership of the Federation owns the Rural Training Research Center located in Sumter County, Alabama. He counsels clients on how to best generate revenue from their land or property. Freddie, welcome to the briefing. It means a lot that you traveled here to be with us today. Thank you. So this was published yesterday. <laughs> It'll be available after the briefing. Um, so we've, uh, Lauren and Brennan talked about the importance of trees and, and, um, and I think we all understand the importance of trees and, and understand what trees do. But I want to come and talk with you guys from a different perspective. Why should I have trees? Why should I, as a forest landowner, have trees? Um, those trees are, are benefiting uh, society as a whole and doing the things that trees do. But why, why should I, as a forest landowner, own trees? What are the benefits to me as a forest landowner? And so I think those are some of the things that we've got to understand is that these, these resources that's, that's being managed by non-industrial private landowners, those are individuals. So what's the benefits to them? And I think the Farm Bill has got the opportunity to address a lot of promoting those forests being, I think we've heard the term um, already, working forest. And that, that working forest means that that forest is not only it's working for all of us, but most importantly, that forest is working for that forest landowner so that that forest landowner can maintain that forest. And, and that's a concept I think we all need to walk away with today is, how do we guarantee that those forests are not converted into other things that might generate a little more revenue to that landowner? Because that landowner's intent is to maintain that land ownership. So there's a, there's a couple of ways that that, that can be addressed in the Farm Bill. Most of agriculture and forestry operations in the U.S. are subsidized by the Department of Agriculture in, in some way or fashion. And there are programs that are geared around um, incentivizing landowners for maintaining that forest land. Uh, it's programs geared around the marketing of, and de developing markets for the wood products that's coming from that forest land. Um, and so I think those are programs that really need to be highlighted in the Farm Bill um, in 2023 because we understand the importance of trees. Um, and I come at it from a little bit different perspective because at, with the Federation, our, the landowners that we work with are historically underserved landowners across the Southeast U.S. And those landowners, right now, those landowners, the average landowner holding is 40 acres. In the, in the realm of forestry, that's, that's rather small. Um, there are a lot of forest landowners out there that have small holdings, um, historically underserved and otherwise. But those forests are the highest risk forests that we have. Those forests are the forests that's being threatened by development. Uh, those are the forests that's being threatened by afforestation. Those are the forests that's being harvested and not replanted. So those, I think the opportunity in the Farm Bill is to address how do we keep those forests as working forests and promoting programs that will, that will really target those lands. Um, there are a couple of flagship programs that when we start talking on the ground management um, through USDA, and that's some of the NRCS programs, um, EQIP, Conservation Stewardship Program, EQIP, Environmental Quality Incentives Program, 
their funding that's that's there to assist landowners with the management practices that will promote a healthy, good forest. And right now, one of the things that we're as a as an organization, the Federation is pushing for larger set asides for historically underserved landowners, so that there's more funding there for those underserved landowners to really participate in forestry, to assist them with maintaining working forest. And um, so what that does is as we go to landowners and talk to them about the importance of trees and, and let them know about what trees, we do provide technical assistance. And technical assistance is one of the other things that's uh, funded through the Farm Bill. So as we take those resources that's allocated to technical assistance to tell landowners about all our opportunities, then we've got the programs and we've got the funding behind those programs to actually back up. So if I come to tell you about managing forests and how important that is, then we've got the resources there in order to promote the use of the technical assistance that we've been providing. So I think uh, we look at increasing the funding on uh, programs that are geared toward incentivizing landowners for having work in forests. Um, and then technical assistance. So I spoke on technical assistance. Technical assistance is important. Um, we, we are lacking in technical assistance in, in the area of forestry. Uh, the industry, forest industry, as forest industry got smaller in the U.S., access to technical assistance also went in the same direction. And a lot of those providers of technical assistance, they... That, that resource just kind of disappeared. That knowledge disappeared um, with, with the, the industry getting smaller and more consolidated. So I think um, you know, the funding around technical assistance is something that we've really got to look at in the, and address in a pointed way. Um, we start talking about uh, carbon programs and having the conversation around carbon programs and what carbon look like. And that's another way to incentivize these forest landowners for maintaining their forest and, and keeping forest forest. But let's look at it at scales. And a lot of this, we got to look at it at scales that can really affect some of these smaller landowners, family forest landowners. Those are the landowners that's important. Those are the, again, those are the higher risk forests. So we've got to look at um, how those carp be intentional about how those carbon programs are working, and look at the ones that we're actually subsidizing, and do they fit all forest landowners? All forest landowners have opportunity to really participate in those programs in a way that it will incentivize them justly for maintaining their forest land. And we look at capacity, um, and look at, look at capacity around managing. So if we've got the funding to do this, um, we've got the, f we've, we've provided the technical assistance, we've got the funding, and now we've got to implement these practices. We've got to implement the prescribed burns. We've got to implement the uh, understory treatments. We've got, to, we've got to go in and, and have the professionals to make these recommendations. So is, there's opportunity around capacity building. And I think that's something that we've got to look at intentionally is how do we build a capacity to, to implement the things that we know needs to be implemented in order to increase and maintain forest land. So those are all opportunities that's within the Farm Bill. Through, and we've got to look at it creatively and say, well, how can we do this? You know, is it working through building capacity on some of the national forests? through some of the contractors that's also working in relation to doing some of the things that's uh, taking place on national forest? Do we use that? Do we use our national forest as a conduit to train professionals that are then available to work with non-industrial private landowners? So I think we've got to kind of step outside of the box and see exactly what that should look like in order to promote the capacity. So we have went through all of this. We've got the capacity. We've got the funding. Now we've got our forest. Now comes the important part. How is this forest going to support me 
owning it. So then we look at the markets and the opportunity around the markets and look at the opportunity around solid wood products and what that looks like. And a lot of the forest land that, that I'm working with, because of the past, um, and, and as an organization, what we're seeing is that we have a lot of mismanaged forests out there. We have a lot of mismanaged forests out there. So we've got a lot of low-value forest products. We've got a lot of low-value forest products out there. That's, um, we saw the slide on bioenergy, biofuels. Um, some of those markets are some of the markets that will allow us to go in and take an unhealthy forest and create a healthy forest by removing some of that low-value material. But, um, and then taking that low value material and using it for energy and, and things of, of that example. So those creating those markets then starts incentivizing those landowners for having working forests. So I guess I said all that to say is we've got to look at this thing as a system from one end to the other end. And if we interject resources at one end and not the other end, our whole forest ecosystem is going to be off. Our, our, the way that things work is going to be off. So let's take this opportunity with the Farm Bill to address it, address this forestry is to issue systematically from management to marketing. Thank you. Thank you, Freddie. That was great. I love systems thinking. It's really the right way to think about a lot of things and also Landowners are part of that system, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and thinking about them and from their perspective makes a ton of sense. Really appreciate that. Uh, our fourth panelist today is Christine Cadigan. Christine is the Executive Vice President for Carbon Origination at the American Forest Foundation. As a family landover herself, Christine has long recognized the unique opportunity for family-owned forests in the U.S. to contribute to meaningful conservation outcomes while still realizing individual objectives for the landowners themselves. Christine has led the Family Forest Carbon Program at AFF since its inception, setting the strategy from ideation to design to implementation. She's been at the American Forest Foundation for almost 12 years and lives and works on her tree farm. Christine, take it away. Really looking forward to your presentation. A little bit shorter than everybody else. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, and thank you to the panelists. Uh, this has actually been really fun to hear and learn from you all, um, and to see many of you off of a Zoom screen for once. Um, I just want to start quickly by um, talking about who the American Forest Foundation is. We're a forest conservation organization that works with and through small family landowners, so um, many of the folks that Freddie was just talking about. And our new strategic direction recognizes that the, we, we feel like the greatest opportunity to, to really make a, an impact, a large scale impact on forest conservation is by considering forests as a natural climate solution to, to climate mitigation. So many of the themes that have sort of threaded a couple of these presentations. Lauren already um, talked about this slide, so I'll do it quickly. Thank you, Lauren, for, for doing this for me. Um, but I, I just want to recognize again that really this next decade is the most critical decade for us to actually stay aligned on a two degree pathway. And given the current available technology, there really is not an option for us to stay on this two degree pathway if we don't consider natural climate solutions. And in the US, what does that look like? Lauren shared that really great slide with all of the green bars, right? In the US, more than half of the natural climate solution potential is with forests. And interestingly, uh, if you go back and look at Lauren's slide again, the, the coloring, the green coloring, um, indicates which of those natural climate solution opportunities are cost effective. And forests not only have a tremendous volume to, to provide, but they're also some of the most cost effective solutions. So it really makes sense to think about how we can um, put these forests to work for a climate mitigation solution. Unfortunately, uh, when, you, when you look at the voluntary carbon marketplace right now, which is where we're, we're actually transacting these, these, nat these nature-based solutions in the form of, of voluntary um, credits, 
Um, very few transactions are actually uh, representative of, of what forests could potentially provide. So you see in this graph, the orange is what's currently transacted in uh, reforestation, improved forest management, or avoided conversion. But the green is the opportunity, right? So there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to put more forests to work and, and infuse more private climate finance in this work. Family forests, so this is the lens with which we do this work. Family forests are the largest ownership share of forest in the US. Um, we also know that our rural forests currently sequester uh, about 15% at ranges, but about 15% of total US emissions. And if we do some of the climate smart forestry uh, tactics that, that Lauren was also talking about, and, and even um, what some of the other panelists were talking about, then we could double that impact. So again, lots of opportunity to invest in forest to do more. But another kind of missed opportunity that we're, we're hoping to fix, right? Um, right now, less than 1% of forest carbon projects are on lands uh, or on individual lands that are less than 5,000 acres. So Freddie talked about how um, the, the population of landowners that he works with, the average owner size is about 40 acres. When you think about small, non-industrial, private forest landers across the US, it's about 70 acres. So lots of individuals, this is 39% of US forests, who own very small individual parcels. And in aggregate are you know, millions of individuals across the landscape who really can't take advantage of these forest carbon projects as they exist today. Why? Quite um, intuitively, they can't capitalize on economies of scale. There's high um, barriers to entry, the costs um, associated with application, inventory, um, long-term monitoring, reporting, verification. Just a, a small landowner can't, um, can't really navigate the complexities of those programs. Um, there's also a lack of technical assistance. So, Freddie talked about technical assistance. Landowners don't really know how to manage their forest. They don't have a professional to talk to to, to help them navigate these decisions. Um, they're just, they, they just need support and help to think about what's right for them. Um, and then the last but not least, and, and we talk about forest carbon markets, or we talk about carbon markets in general, there's a lot of market volatility there. And these are some risks that landowners themselves, families themselves, are not yet ready, really respond, not yet ready to assume responsibility for. So that comes back to the, the opportunities within the Farm Bill. What could potentially be the, the government's role? Um, and one of the major ways that we think that there's opportunity here is that uh, these one-time grants, these investments, can really be that this kind of catalytic force that, that um, leverages projects that, that are interested in, in leveraging opportunities through forest carbon markets, um, other ways to, to infuse private climate finance into this work. So thinking about these, these one-term investments as opportunities for this long-term, large-scale impact. So I wanted to, to take you through a quick exercise. Um, this, uh, this slide right here represents the current investment in small forest landowner and, and forest conservation. So what you'll see represented in, in the black here is the business as usual farm bill conservation spending. So there's a lot of great programs, EQIP, um, CSP, Freddie talked about how, how um, instrumental those, those programs are in supporting forest landowners. Um, the IRA and the bipartisan infrastructure law, huge unprecedented investment. That's that huge bump that you see. Um, all of a sudden we have, you know, millions and millions more dollars that, that all will, will be invested in, in forest conservation. Um, so that's current investment in, in small forest landowners. So imagine with me that you take 1% of that total, just 1%, and divert it to projects that specifically leverage uh, private climate finance through the voluntary carbon market. Imagine that reality. All of a sudden, what we see is exponential impact in forest conservation. So we're using, we're unlocking the potential of this private climate finance, and we're putting it to work in forests. And you see through the end of the decade, it's like a $12 billion difference. Uh, and that's a pretty massive impact on forest conservation, and importantly, on climate mitigation and natural climate solutions. So what can we specifically do in, in the Farm Bill? Um, first and foremost, that like, I, like I mentioned before and like uh, my fellow panelists have, have mentioned, 
um, the IRA and the, and the um, bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, historic level of investments um, in small and underserved landowners in particular, um, programs like the U.S. Forest Service Landscape Scale Restoration Program, the NRCS conservation programs like EQIP, CSP. Um, first and foremost, it's important to protect these, these uh, investments and do so in a way that really respects the innovative and equitable spirit with which they were authorized. Um, so that's the uh, priority number one for the Farm Bill. And I should say too, Lauren, thank you for mentioning um, the Forest and the Farm Bill and the Forest Climate Working Group. Um, many of these recommendations that all of us really have, have proposed, you'll see represented in, in the, those co coalitions platforms as well. So it's another good resource. Um, in thinking about some administrative flexibilities which we might explore in the next Farm Bill, um, so, so I think Freddie maybe, I can't remember if you touched on this, but I know we've talked about this in the past, um, thinking about how we can administer some of those Farm Bill conservation programs more equitably um, and thinking about um, uh, match exemptions or cost share or um, cost share exemptions um, for some un underserved landowners in particular uh, and match flexibility, that's what I meant to say. Um, another thing to consider is we learned, or the, in the 2014 Farm Bill when um, RCPP was created, it was this great, innovative, awesome program that we we're all excited for. And you know, a couple years later, a couple grant cycles later, I think we've learned a little bit more about what it takes to actually implement these programs. Um, so I think there's opportunity to streamline RCPP delivery even more, invest in the partner capacity. These are the partners that are actually implementing these programs, um, and also increase access of partners so that they can work directly with landowners more comprehensively and really build that, that trusting relationship. And the, the last piece that I'll talk about before we dive into panel discussion is the Rural Forest Markets Act. This is a marker bill that AFF has been working on. Um, and what it does actually is, is um, hopefully unlock private, um, private climate finance uh, a little bit more holistically, <laughs> a little bit more excessively to some of these project developers. Um, so essentially, it's a loan or a bond guarantee uh, that, project, that partners, project developers can use um, to access mainstream um, capital, mainstream investments. Uh, and we can, if you consider um, some of the provisions include, included in uh, the Rural Forest Markets Act, I think we can consider some of those investments within the Farm Bill itself. Um, so one other thing to, to think about. And I think that's it. So I'll turn it back over to you guys. Thank you. was a great presentation. Um, that brings us, like Christine was just saying, that brings us to our Q&A. Uh, and so we have, someone has a microphone. Uh, there you have the microphone. Uh, and so if anyone has questions in the audience, catch my eye and raise your hand and we'll do our best to get to them. Um, and perhaps to get us started, um, I'm going to, I have two things. One, this is a little, we don't usually do this, but someone on our YouTube channel asked us for a link, Lauren, to the paper that was allegedly published today. Would you mind sharing audibly through the microphone the link and then also writing it down so Dan O can put it in the YouTube chat yeah. or YouTube comments? Um, it's um, in Plus Climate. It's P-L-O-S Climate. Um, so just like the name of the paper, you think? Um, the, yeah, wherever someone could Google or Yeah, Google for it. Plus Climate and my last name, Cooper, uh, Climate Smart Forestry. I hope that would pull it up. McFarland is my co-author on it. I should do it, but, and it's just out, so I was going to share the link before, but I didn't have it yet, so it's, it's supposed to have come out at 2 p.m. Eastern today. <laughs> it may I'm not be, making it up. <laughs> yeah, it's just, this is getting a little too, yeah. I know. Um, so it's P-L-O-S, and it should, it should, I think you should be able to find it, yeah. Is it publicly available? Is it something we could add to the briefing page? Yes. It's okay. It'll be open source, yeah. So for the people on the YouTube open channel who had that question, we'll also post it with the, with the presentation materials on the YouTube page Great. as well to make that Thanks easier. for your interest, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so to get us started with questions, I would like to um, sort of start with one about sort of the differences between public and private ownership of forests. And... Um, my question is, how does forest management differ across public versus private lands? And what are the most important things to understand about those distinctions in the context of a farm bill? And Lauren, maybe we'll start with you and then we'll go down through the line hearing from Brendan and Freddie and Christine. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, thanks for thanks for the question. It is it is very important, and it's really interesting that the farm bill though does um, have an opportunity to to reach across different um, land landowner types and um, and different jurisdictions um, between the forest and private. I think generally it's important to distinguish that private has a scale of landowners and they have different goals and different capacities to manage um, their land or have intervention. So Freddie gave us very helpful insights into the smaller and um, Christine also um, backed that up, some of the challenges for smaller landowners. So that's whether accessing technical assistance or even just having market information and understanding what the options may be. Um, and then having the capacity to actually implement that. So there's a lot of really fundamental barriers to undertaking these actions. Larger landowners, though, also sometimes need incentives to, um, so whether it's large industrial actors, incentives, um, access to um, best practices. Um, but there's, you know, when we look though at forests and some of the challenges facing forests, they don't end at any jurisdiction or any landowner type. And so there's a lot of um, opportunity, I think, to think really holistically at a landscape level. Um, and for public lands, it's not it's not always an, a, a fair assumption that they have all the resources that they need. Um, and there's provisions in the Farm Bill, actually, Good Neighbor Authority, that um, allows for actors to support across public land um, the implementation of key practices um, and work together to deal with um, threats to forests or to assist with management. Um, and so there's a lot of collaboration, really, I think, across all of it. And, and there's even potential for more of that. Um, but even that, even that like public private distinction is, is one big distinction, but then even within there, there's quite a lot of variation. Um, and so, yeah, so just to, just to say, I think that especially with the changing climate again, um, there's a, a need really on all fronts to make sure that there's resources and capacity to deal with the challenges. Um, and that's both in just the technical assistance and underground implementation, but also to make sure that there is the markets and the economic rationale to make sense because there's, it's wonderful that we have these large investments, but as like Christine alluded to, there's opportunities to really have them as catalysts that are creating permanent changes in our economy and how we value forests and the and diversify the options, um, which are which actually are important for both public and private landowners. Like private landowners are engaging in carbon markets, but there's a project in Michigan on public lands that's also doing that. So um, so some of even those are not are not divided by by the landowner type, but certainly the support and having adequate resources um, are are important across the board. Thanks. Brendan, what are some differences from your perspective about public and private land, uh, land management? Well, I was going to maybe echo Lauren that, that a lot of it is, is, the same, is the same, right? I mean, the, the lines you, you, you often will walk from public to private to public to private, you know, in, in, the, mm -hmm. in a short distance. And so uh, just, just emphasizing that the ability to, to really focus on that, the, the information, right? I mean, it's a rapidly changing environment how we sh can and should manage forests need, you know, it needs to be l looked at closely, right? And, and we need to be innovative in how, in how we're doing this. And so the ability of the, the Farm Bill to engage both government agencies and the private sector uh, to be pushing out information, technical assistance, the best science on, on how to manage really really is critical, I think, and just getting more critical like every minute. So when you suddenly have fire regimes that are different than they were when people grew up, um, it, it's changing rapidly. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, yeah, I would just emphasize the, you know, the importance of, of, um, of you know, the, the federal role in, in advancing you know, uh, the best practices as our climate is changing. Freddie, in, in places where um, the Federation serves, communities that you all work with, what are some differences in terms of how forests, forests are managed uh, between the public and the private sector? I think um, I, I'll do just the opposite of what you just said. Okay. I'll do just the opposite of what you just asked. So <laughs> I, I'll tell you about the likeness right off is in, in the areas that, that we work in, there's a heavy heirs property issue where you've got tenants in common that might not have the same management objective. I see that as being public lands. I, I see the commonality there. And that, that really affects the management decisions that's being made on public 
and the private lands that we're working with. And I think policies to address both of them are something that's going to be critical in the in the future of you know having sustainable public lands, lands that's actually going to be beneficial mm -hmm. um, to the public. Um, might actually take some management that that we need to educate the public on what we what we're doing, and and same policies we need. Um, through the farm bill and addressing heirs' property with the landowners that we're working with. Great, thanks. Christine, would you like the last word on this? Sure, yeah. The, the only thing I would add that hasn't been said is, um, particularly with private landowners, with non-industrial private landowners, there's complex ownership structures. There's a million different ownership structures. Heirs' property issues is, is one of the issues that comes along with some of those varied ownership. And that just makes for really complex decision-making processes. So that's first and foremost. It's hard to get all of the owners on board to make a decision. It's hard to, to make these decisions legally. Um, and then the second thing that I would mention um, that's different for, for small landowners is the operability factor. So with large landowners, with public landowners, um, obviously, again, you can capitalize on those economies of scale. You can get operators out there to do the work that you need to do on the ground. With small landowners, it's just a lot harder to do that. It's harder to access them. It's harder to find them. It's harder to, to count on them to be able to sort of service your needs. Um, so just a lot more different and varied challenges with this large, um, disparate, disaggregated group of landowners. Thanks. So this has come up a couple times today. It's, we're here in Washington, it's very hazy. And the cause of that haze are wildfires in Canada. And so I'm curious how your work intersects with wildfire mitigation, whether that's pre-fire mitigation, fighting active fires, and post-fire recovery. And Brendan, maybe we should start with you, uh, and we can go down through the line and, uh, and end with Lauren. It's a huge issue, um, and, and lots of, uh, well, particularly in the West, but now increasingly everyone, I think, needs to pay attention to that. Um, uh, you know, well, it's also, it, it's just, it's a huge challenge, right? It's a, it's a big issue, and it's a big challenge to figure out how best to manage. You know, some, some of the federal investments that have been made and the ability to invest further in, uh, as you were mentioning, in, you know, reducing fuels in, in, in forest management with, with climate risks in mind um, is, is critically important. And states like California, the Forest Service, others, are, I think, uh, in, others in the research and academic are, are sort of working to figure out how, uh, how to do that. Um, we're sort of on the implementing side at, at Trust for Public Land, so uh, these questions become uh, real when you're trying to preserve you know, um, it may be huge, maybe 100,000 acres that you want to have accessible for the public. You want it to be providing biodiversity, wildlife, water quality benefits for the long term. Understanding how uh, best to manage that for the fire risk uh, mm -hmm. is critical, and so we're consumers of that of that information. Um, but then also on on the on the um, the WUI, right, the wildland urban interface and and communities that uh, aren't even in, in the wildlands, but uh, are in fire-prone areas, um, these issues are, are going to become uh, more and more more and more critical. Freddie, could you explain a little bit more about how your work uh, intersects with um, the wildfire challenges that we're facing? The, the, the use of prescribed burn and the comfort with using fire in forest, I think is, you know, in providing for us is providing that education and that hands-on exposure to landowners uh, with fire. That's doing fire demonstrations, things like that, um, where we've got groups that come out or we go out on their forest and implement fires to get people comfortable with using fire because fire is one of our best tools at preventing wildfires. And, and so it's, um, I think that's, that's where the intersection is. But also there's an opportunity, I think, with, um, we talk about the resources that's being used to fight fire. Well, where, what community are those resources being used in? Mm -hmm. How diverse is our fire fighting effort? You know, I think when we talk about a system, we got to look at the whole system because those resources come back to the communities when fire season's over. And what do they do? 
they implement fire within their community or they fight fire within their communities. You know, so I think it's opportunities there to build capacity in these areas. When we start talking about the funding and funding pools and where we're spending resources, we'll, we'll talk about integrating and or going into underserved communities and talking about forestry. But let's talk about building this system that's going to be there when we leave. That's going to that's going to be sustainable or regenerative. That, that's the new word, regenerative. It's going to be regenerative. It's going to restore. So uh, that's it. <laughs> that's great. Christine? Yeah, um, Brendan and I were chatting about this a little bit before the panel started and just acknowledging that the, the cause of the haze today um, is from the fires in Nova Scotia, right? And these are fires uh, in an ecosystem that they are just not uh, sort of unprecedented in recorded history. They don't have the infrastructure to support that. Um, and so thinking about how we can start to prepare these places that have less familiarity, less kind of understanding of these um, potential uh, catastrophic impacts, I think it comes down to um, increased technical assistance for landowners, encouraging active forest management. Um, so we talked a lot about these climate smart forestry practices. Yes, of course, they help um, enhance the carbon storage and sequestration, but they also help enhance the climate resiliency of these forests so that they can better respond to these catastrophic events, um, which, of course, many of the Farm Bill Conservation Programs promote, right? It's all about incorporating many of these um, activities, these management activities on the ground. Um, and then the, the last piece, particularly from a landowner's perspective, is long-term planning. So actually just thinking about what does it mean to manage your forest? What are some of the things that I should be considering? You know, many folks just kind of, it's the woods out back, right? They mm -hmm. haven't really given it an, an extra thought. Uh, so I think some of these are all um, investments and programs and things that, that the Farm Bill can do to help us prepare for more of these catastrophic events. Great. Lauren, I think this gives you the last word at our briefing today. We're just about at time. Um, okay, well, I would just add one, one extra piece to the, the fire. We, Topic because it is so scary, really, and it's very daunting. Um, but to try to look at it from even a positive lens is to bring it back to like jobs and additional what what needs to happen at what scale and who's going to do the work and how do we make sure that they're compensated or they have the expertise. Um, and we need a diverse workforce. We need to attract very diverse people to this field for a really wide range of activities, everything from the forestry side, but what to do with materials if you're taking materials out. We need a lot of innovation. Um, and so the Farm Bill obviously really can directly support a wide range of activities to make sure that the forests are healthy and that we have, we're being proactive as much as we can, but also thinking of building a system that is different and functions different and attracts people um, to this work for the long term. So I will leave it at that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to our tremendous panel today. Thank you, Lauren, Brendan, Freddie, and Christine uh, for your excellent presentations and for joining us today. It was a really great conversation. I learned a ton. Um, and I'm going to go back and look at Lauren's slides and everyone else's slides as well. Uh, and everyone else can do that as well. If you want to go back and revisit any of the presentation, we'll have an archive webcast. Um, so very big thanks to Representative Carter and his awesome staff for helping us uh, get the room today, which is always a big lift, and also for uh, joining us via pre-recorded video remarks. I'd um, like to say once again, big thanks to Nathan and Francis at US Nature for Climate. Always a huge pleasure to work with them. And thanks to Doug and Ali at NCBA as well uh, for helping us network uh, across the cooperative landscape, if, if you will, and for being a really great panelist at our rural development panel. Seriously, if you didn't check it out, you got to check it out. Um, I'd also like to say big thanks to my colleagues, uh, Dan O'Brien, Omri, Allison, Anna, and Molly. And we are joined today. Nicole just joined our policy team this week. This is her first briefing. So she'll always remember sort of what it was like, right? <laughs> The bloom is still on the rose. Um, and so welcome, Nicole. We're really happy to have you here in our on, on our policy team. We also have four interns, which I think might be a record. We should make it like the cabinet, where one of them has to stay back at the office just in case. Um, but big thanks to Georgia, Isabella, Parthov, and Sydney uh, for being with us today. Um, I mentioned our mass timber, uh, mass timber fact sheet. Uh, we've got that's coming up. Uh, I don't know if there's a slide on that. I was thinking there might be, but my clicker is not clicking. Anyway, um, do we have the survey slide? Is it? 
Is it earlier? I think I saw it earlier. Let me put that up. Hold on a second. Yeah, this is this is wild. This is like, watch it. This is like the tenant version of our briefing. <laughs> nope. Okay, well, anyway, um, Diana will put the survey slide. While he's doing that, uh, we've got the Mass Timber fact sheet coming out. Subscribe to Climate Change Solutions so you don't miss that. It'll be really, really good. We also have some upcoming briefings. Uh, the two I think that um, I can uh, plug two weeks from today, we'll be back up here for conservation. It'll be a really, really great briefing. Uh, and we will also have our, there it is, thank you very much. Uh, we'll also have um, our Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo and Policy Forum on Tuesday, July 18th. This is an all-day event. Uh, we're even going to have a reception, which is going to be really fun. We're working with uh, our friends, uh, Senator Reed and Senator Crapo, who chair the Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. So that's going to be a really, really great event. We're going to have six panels, have an exhibition space, and like I said, we're going to have a party at the end of the day as well. So uh, check out our website uh, so that you can RSVP with that. Uh, and the thing that Dan O was putting up is this is just a link to our survey. Uh, if you have a few moments and you'd like to share your feedback about today's briefing, um, it was really, really helpful. We read every response, um, and that's the link. If you had any AV problems, if you had any technical problems, if you have ideas, uh, anything like that, uh, you can use the survey to communicate that with us. Um, our battery is running low, so we're going to end right now. Uh, before the computer turns off. So I hope everyone has a great rest of your Wednesday, and thank you again, panelists, for joining us for this really great briefing. Thanks.